A new day dawns in Justice League history when the Justice League United forms to enlist all heroes of Earth. Unfortunately, Darkseid has a new day planned as well that could rip reality apart. Let's talk about it in our review of DC All In Special number one from DC Comics. See you in three. Welcome back to Comical Opinions. This is our review of DC All In Special number one. You know, this may be arguably the most important comic for DC in the last five years and maybe even more. Why? Because it sets the stage for the new status quo of Earth after the events of Absolute Power and explains the foundations of the Absolute imprint, which DC creators have been pushing hard for its unique takes on the Holy Trinity. Well, to be fair, you certainly get an explanation for the creation of the Absolute Universe, but the gimmicky comic construction the disparate art between the two halves of the book and the wonky explanations don't quite generate the excitement DC was hoping for. Before we hop into the story, I'm going to give you a quick disclaimer. The events of DC All In Special Number 1 take place after the Absolute Power finale. You don't need to know how Absolute Power Number 4 ends to get the gist of what's happening, except that all of Earth's heroes are back to normal, which shouldn't surprise anybody. That said, you may find it preferable to read Absolute Power Number 4 before reading this comic. Second, DC All In Special Number 1 is broken up into two halves that converge at a single point. The first half centers on the reformation of the Justice League Unlimited 52 days after a pivotal event. The second half focuses on the pivotal event and the 52 days leading up to the collision with the Justice League Unlimited. I'll cover each separately since each is created by separate creative teams and, to be frank, it shows. The first half of the issue begins with a title simply named 52 Days Later. Through a montage of scenes narrated by Superman, we learn that the Justice League is ready to reform, but with a few changes. The League will be expanded to include every major hero who has proven their worth. A new watchtower will become a touchpoint and home for every leaguer, with Oracle on communications and Question on security, and each leaguer gets a nifty new ID card for everyone who's been invited. The cards are infused with a combination of tech, power, and magic to create these to-be-determined enhancements for the person who carries it. It's hinted at, but it never really explained what the cards will do to enhance each hero's power, but we'll find out. Although it's brief, the montage is effective. It's off to a solid start. Presumably, Scott Snyder wrote the first half, and it's as good a way to inaugurate the Justice League Unlimited as anyone could expect. Snyder's choice of words for Superman's narration creates a vibe of hope and optimism, and you can see that optimism reflected in the reactions of the lesser heroes who get an invite, such as Blue Beetle and Roy Harper. The issue then switches over to the focal point of the majority of the first half, which is the character known as Booster Gold. Booster feels lost of late and considers returning to his own time when Superman offers him a JLU card. Booster immediately accepts because he recognizes the card as a pivotal historic milestone for museum displays in his time in the future. Later, Booster attends an orientation meeting at the new Watchtower to hear about the wondrous operations that will serve this new era of the JLU. Just as a side note, Booster Gold was chosen as the focal character for a specific reason that will become clear shortly. And I like that Booster finally has a chance to be given a challenge much greater than anything he's faced before. Booster Gold has the potential to be a more popular character than he's been given credit for. So I, I like that he becomes sort of the, maybe not the main hero, but he, we're seeing the story unfold through his eyes in a lot of ways. So, so far I'm on board with where the story is going. Suddenly, alerts start sounding during the orientation meeting. Darkseid, who's missing a hand and replaced with his big battle axe, and bonded with the Spectre, emerges from a tear in space-time. The collective of heroes leap into action. The magic wielders know that the only chance to stop this version of Darkseid is to separate him from Spectre. So they cast a spell on the only being who could contain that amount of magic and face Darkseid solo. In this case, it happens to be Superman. The gambit worked, but tearing Spectre from Darkseid destroyed him and created a rift in reality to a new corner of the multiverse that was hinted at or may been, may have been suspected was there from Mr. Terrific and a few other characters, but they could never quite see. And now they see it. It's a aspect of the multiverse created from dark side energy. They call it the Else World. They also call it the Alpha World. And they also call it the Absolute Universe. Now we have the mission that's being set that forms the foundation of what happens for everything after. Unfortunately, 
Alpha World, we're just going to call it that because they couldn't set all the names, so we're just going to pick one, has an unstable time flow, which is sort of very hand-wavy, but it, it sort of makes sense. The only heroes who can step foot in this new world are time travelers. And there you go. Booster volunteers to pay Alpha World a 10-minute visit for recon, gather data, and return via a tether Mr. Terrific suddenly, miraculously, and very instantaneously creates for skeets. Of course, the recon mission doesn't go as planned because Booster finds some very scary stuff on Alpha World. Overall, for the first half of DC All-In Special Number 1, it's well done with a fairly solid concept, excellent work by Daniel Samperi, and a threat that feels big enough to warrant the reformation of the new Justice League. That said, everything following Darkseid's death by cop suicide attack, which is basically what it winds up being, and the explanation for what happens afterwards feels a bit rushed, a little bit too hand-wavy and convenient, and mildly forced in spots. Very strong start, but the ending doesn't quite match up to the rest of the first half. And then we transition into the second half, which is basically read in the opposite direction. I, we got it digitally. I'm not sure what it looks like on paper, but we'll find out. The second half of the issue, titled 52 Days Earlier, begins by following Darkseid as he ponders a strange discovery. When the multiverse was severed during the events of Absolute Power, I'm just saying that in air quotes because it doesn't quite play out that way, but okay, he felt a surge of energy unlike anything he's ever known. Being the curious fellow that he is, Darkseid commissions the creation of a wish machine, he literally calls it a wish machine, that will only work for him. Why? Well, here's where the issue gets a little convoluted and messy. Darkseid is desperate to find out how and where he felt that surge of energy, so he begins searching for the one man to answer his question. How he came to that conclusion, I'm not sure, but the one man turns out to be Jim Corgan, aka the Spectre. Since Spectre is the wrath of God and he has a connection to the divine, he's the only being who could grant Darkseid the power to break creation and bring everything back together in the way that would give him the most power. In his search for Spectre, Darkseid encounters an assortment of beings determined to stop Darkseid from getting to Spectre, including Eclipso, Zoriel, and the Quintessence. Now, why would those big heavy hitters be trying to stop Darkseid from getting to the Spectre? Well, these powerful beings all know that Darkseid is the check and balance to hope and life in reality. Darkseid is because reality requires him to be. The surge he felt was a result of the multiverse severing and part of the Darkseids from across the multiverse collapsing into himself, inhabiting all the other universes that were severed and then rushing that energy back into him. I may not be explaining it right, but it's sort of that. Darkseid has been weak lately because last year's DC events collapsed the Omniverse back into a plain old multiverse. So his weakness of late is a natural artifact of the multiverse sort of settling in and correcting itself into a more natural size and state. Sort of. So follow me here. This is what's going on. Darkseid believes that if he can untether himself as a corrective balance to the multiverse, all Darksides will collapse into a single being and become the absolute dark side, or something to that effect. To accomplish his task, Darkseid must bond with Spectre against his will, and he needs the Wish Machine to do it. He'll then use that power to pierce the veil between realities to find a group of heroes powerful enough to destroy him, which brings us back to the first half of the comic, and be reborn as a singular being, untethered from the multiverse with a world built from his collective energy. Did you get all that? Good, because I'm not even sure I understand it, even though I just said it. So the second half of DC All-In Special Number 1 dovetails into the ending of the first half with that same Titanic fight, Booster Gold taking on a dangerous recon mission, and the time-displaced hero finding something that spells big trouble. We're not going to spoil it here because there's a, a new team of characters that show up that uh, spells big trouble for everyone involved. Overall, the second half of the DC All-In Special Number 1 is far more convoluted and messy than the first half. Joshua Williamson, who I believe is the writer, even though the credits aren't clear about that, aims for a highbrow narration with Darkseid, which is kind of more overblown and flowery than it needed to be, but the mountain of mental shenanigans you have to work out to figure out Darkseid's plan will give you a headache. Plus, the artwork, which is comprised of thick, sketchy lines, doesn't hold a candle to Sampiri's work in the first half. So in terms of writing and art, you have a vastly different set of qualities from one creative team to the next. 
All right, let's talk about the just a broad brush positives and negatives, starting with what is great about DC All in Special Number One. Putting aside the wildly inconsistent continuity and the mental gymnastics needed to make it all work, the core idea does have merit. Earth Prime, or whatever DC is calling the mainline Earth, is aware of an Elseworld Earth where the absolute lineup can be told without canonical restrictions while still creating a pathway for the Elseworld characters to interact with the mainline characters in a way that makes sense. This construct realigns the multiverse into a system for more Elseworld stories with crossover potential. Now admittedly, readers may argue that this idea makes the multiverse more convoluted than it already is. And I get that, and I, to a certain degree, I, I agree with that. But I appreciate the attempt to try and make lemonade from the multiverse lemons. Also, the highlight of this issue is a bit of long overdue character growth for Booster Gold. It's one thing to arrive on the scene as a self-centered buffoon, which was how he started off, but he hasn't changed much from that reputation in a lot of years. So it's good to see Booster grow up a little and have those steps of maturity recognized by the characters around him especially from, in this case, Superman. So let's talk about the negatives and what's not great about DC All in Special Number 1. As you've kind of already guessed from my tone of voice and some of the observations we've made, the comic is a mixed bag for a lot of reasons. As a broad criticism, the art and the writing quality is vastly different from the first half to the second half. If this is the comic that's supposed to set the foundation for DC going forward into the future, they needed to put their best foot forward. This creative choice to do two separate creative teams with very different styles, both in writing and art, and to do this gimmicky half and half comic that reads front to back and then back to front, it, it's more annoying than interesting. So I'm not sure why they chose to go that route, and it doesn't look like they put their best foot forward. Next, Darkseid's path to absolute power, and apologies, no pun intended, and boy, I'm getting really sick of that phrase doesn't make sense when you consider he went through the trouble of building himself a wish machine. He literally calls it a wish machine. Why go through all the trouble of piercing the veil of reality and allowing himself to be killed to untether himself from existence when he can simply wish for a new existence? It doesn't make any sense. Next, Darkseid's path to, again, sorry, absolute power lessens the character because he doesn't pursue his goals for any other reason than he wants to. When he encounters resistance from, say, Eclipso and the Quintessence and Zoriel, they offer him everything he's ever wanted to convince him to stop his path to get the Spectre. By refusing those gifts that serve as the foundation of his motivations, Darkseid becomes a one-dimensional villain who only wants power simply to have it. Darkseid had wants and desires that motivated his personality and explained who he was and formed the foundation of his relatability to the reader. So taking those desires away removes his motivations, making him less fully formed. In other words, they made Darkseid worse with this ploy, not better. Next, the explanation for the creation of Alpha World, we'll call it that. Darkseid's predicament and everything that comes after is not only a mess, but it uses the bits and pieces of DC events over the last few years to form a foundation for how it happened. It's fair to say almost every one of these events was a flop. If you look at Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths, Lazarus Planet, Night Terrors, and everything in between, they were all terrible and they were flops. So why build the next era of DC history on a faulty foundation? Everyone would rather forget Night Terrors ever happened. So let's stop referencing it. So when you take all those negatives, put them together, add a few sprinkles here and there that we just don't have time to cover. In effect, you get a double-sized comic. It's about 60-odd pages. At a standard cover price, I believe it's $4.99, which is good. You don't want to be overpriced. But you get a comic that's just half sort of okay. To be generous, this issue is mediocre. If DC All-In Special Number 1 is meant to be the most important comic to set the foundation for DC strategically going forward, DC is not off to the absolute best start, and I apologize for that pun, but just can't get away from it. Final thoughts. What do we think about DC All-In Special Number 1? It begins a new era for the reformed Justice League just in time for Darkseid to hatch his most diabolical plan yet. Broken up into two comics as a gimmick works in theory, but the execution is far from perfect, with the first half stumbling towards the end, and a second half that delivers much less quality overall when compared to the first. This was supposed to be DC's most important comic in years, but it sure doesn't feel like it. 
Therefore, DC All-In Special number one earns a 6 out of 10. The one comic meant to kick off DC's issue feels big, but the execution and entertainment factor don't live up to the expectations. But what do you think? How much stock are you putting into the absolute imprint as the line that's going to turn DC's fortunes around? Leave a thumbs up if you found this review helpful and drop a comment below with which absolute comic you think will be the best seller out of the bunch. Probably going to be Batman, but we'll see. Also, remember to click on the link in the description to read the written review. Check out the variant covers and preview pages for the ones that we've had so far. And buy this comic to help support the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So thank you very much for joining and stay tuned through the outro for more reviews just like this one.